The European system will falter for any number of reasons. The first rationale is both the most obvious and the least manageable. Europe's baby bust started before Asia's, with the Europeans passing the point of demographic no return even before the new millennium. Belgium, Germany, Italy, and Austria will all age into mass retirement in the first half of the 2020s, while nearly every country in a central European line from Estonia to Bulgaria is aging even faster and will age out in the second half. Even worse, demographics alone ensure that Europe as we know it will collapse on a similar time schedule. When the Central European states joined the EU in the 2000s, they succeeded in convincing the Western Europeans to open their labor markets. Some one-fourth to one-third of the young worker population of the Central European region decamped for better personal economic prospects to the West. Western Europe's demographic figures are far worse than they actually appear. Whether it's because Central Europeans return home when the going gets tough, which robs Western Europe of its workforce, or because more Central Europeans head to Western Europe when the going gets tough because those are the only jobs left, the labor balance that has enabled European economic functionality since 2008 is about to evaporate. The demographic problem haunts in a second way. Europe has aged to the point that it cannot absorb its own products. Europe must maintain a high level of exports to maintain its system. The top destination is the United States, a country that is turning ever inward. The United States is also exploring a similarly broad spectrum trade deal with the United Kingdom. As any future trade peace with the EU will soon require London's sign-off, no one in continental Europe should count on easy rectification. The European products that do not go to the United States instead travel to the far side of the planet, Northeast Asia. Even if, against all odds, the Northeast Asian system, as well as Northeast Asian demand for European products, survives, the Americans will no longer be guaranteeing freedom of the seas for civilian maritime shipping. The route from Shanghai to Hamburg is a breezy 12,000 nautical miles. At the zippy 17 miles per hour that modern container ships typically sail at, that's a cool 35-day trip. The fastest any commercial cargo vessel can sail is 25 knots. That's still three full weeks, a lot of time to spend sailing through waters invested with pirates, privateers, hostile navies, or some combination of the three. Perhaps even worse, the part of Europe that maintains the most robust trade relationship with the Chinese is Germany. German product sales to China skew very heavily in the direction of machinery used to make other products, products for export. Even if, against all odds, Germany and China can maintain a trade relationship in a world where they lack the strategic reach to interact directly, Chinese exports will not be nearly as needed, undermining the base rationale for any sort of German-Chinese interaction. The same broad strategic issues that face the Asians also face the Europeans, although those particular problems are of less or more concern depending upon location and perspective. Most European countries started industrializing in the 1800s, with even the laggards, largely the former Soviet satellite states, beginning at the latest in the 1950s. That means most mines in Europe have been tapped out for at least a few decades. The Europeans, having been industrialized for at minimum a couple of generations, may not consume as many materials as the Asians, but they produce even fewer. The Chinese might import the vast majority of the materials they need, but typically, the Europeans must import them all. Most of the industrial commodities required for modern life come from locations far closer to Europe than East Asia, such as the Western Hemisphere and Africa. Several European countries, France and the United Kingdom come to mind, but so too do Spain, the Netherlands, Italy, and Denmark, have sufficient naval capacity to protect occasional shipping to and from the locations in question. Just as good, most sailings from these regions to Europe are unlikely to pass through any particularly contested waters. As to Western Hemispheric sourcing, the Americans are certain to put the kibosh on any sort of piracy or privateering in their hemisphere and European commerce is unlikely to be barred so long as it remains unmilitarized. 
The trick will come from those European countries farther removed from the continent's far west, who lack both access and naval forces. They must source materials from a different, close location. Russia. Germany cannot maintain its position as a wealthy and free nation without the Americans. But Germany also cannot maintain its position as a modern, industrialized nation without Russia. The story of all things German and Russian is about alternating chapters of begrudging cooperation and incisive conflict. As searing as that is for the Germans and Russians, it is far worse for the peoples between them countries essential to Germany's manufacturing supply chains. The Ukraine war is already forcing some tough questions upon all involved. Even all this assumes nothing goes wrong within Europe. Europe suffers from one of those weird geographies where just enough of it is flat and well-rivered and easy to walk across that portions of the continent are convinced that they can and should lead a major consolidated power while there are just enough bits that are peninsular or mountainous or island to play host to dissident powers that will always dash such dreams. It's only during the order that global peace and wealth smothered the age-old contest between the two visions. Despite 75 years of healing and growth and safety and security and modernization and freedom and democracy, much internal angst and grievance remains. Brexit, occurring at the very height of globalization, is a case in point. With the American withdrawal, that smothering ends. The Germanocentric system cannot maintain its current position, much less grow. And no one in the world has a strategic interest in bailing it out. The challenge for Central Europe will be to keep the Germans from acting like a normal country. The last seven times Germany did... Things got historical. Europe's subsidiary trade networks look more favorable than the Germanocentric system. The Sweden-centric system might be able to hold together. Northern Europe's supply chains are less exposed to potential threats, its energy supplies are more local, and its demographics are less aged and slower aging, suggesting a better match between supply and demand that would limit the need for extra regional imports and exports in the first place. In the North Sea, the Scandinavians even have sufficient oil and natural gas to meet nearly all their demand. All they need to do is somehow source the various industrial inputs they need from a continent away. They have two options. The first is to partner with the French system, at least in part. In addition to France boasting sufficient domestic consumption to absorb its own production, it also has sufficient geographic insulation and positioning to reach the needed inputs. Add in a competent expeditionary military and a nearly galactic volume of self-regard, and France can reasonably go its own way.